Hi everyone, my name is Elizabeth Yin, and I'm the CEO and co-founder of a company called Launchbit, which is an ad network for email. So I'm super psyched to be here today because I actually got my first introduction to startups when I was in high school as well. I'm also from the Bay Area. In fact, I'm from Mountain View. So I, I can definitely relate. I think you guys have the advantage of a really awesome startup education that took me a lot longer to figure out. So one day when I was in ninth grade, my best friend Jennifer said to me, hey, you know, my cousin's starting an internet company. Do you want to help him? over winter break for a couple of days. I had no idea what an internet company was, and uh, I had nothing going on during winter break, so I was like, sure, why not? So we hopped in the Caltrain, went up to San Francisco to her cousin's office. We helped them build some chairs and some, some tables and ethernet cables and stuff like that. Honestly, I don't think we were really any help at all, but those one or two days that we were there like, left a very lasting, long-lasting impression on my life. I was just super psyched by all the energy that I saw in that room. Here were a whole bunch of friends working together to build something. And it was super casual. They could wear whatever they wanted. They could eat all the pizza they wanted. It was, it was a dream. And I knew that that was what I wanted to do when I grew up. But fast forward a bit. So high school came and went. And college pretty much came and almost went. And so the end of my senior year of college over at Stanford, I was trying to figure out what I was going to do after graduation. And I had in my head that I wasn't ready to start a company yet. Uh, not really sure why. But anyway, I just wasn't ready for that. And I thought that what I really wanted to do was I really wanted to go to business school. And I was very intrigued by a couple of schools, Harvard and MIT, that were both in Boston. And I wanted to visit. But unfortunately, I didn't have the money to go. So, Right around that time, October 2003, it just so happened that in Boston, there was going to be a job fair. In fact, every October, or at least this is how it used to be, um, the largest job fair for jobs in Japan, outside of Japan, is held in Boston around that time. And they were offering scholarships. They were going to pay for somebody's free trip to Boston from anywhere in the US. So I was like, oh, OK, well, this is how I might fund my trip to Boston. So I applied for this scholarship, and I got it. And so I got to go to Boston on the dime of this job fair, which had nothing to do with business school. And I went, and I visited my school, had a great time. But as part of my reimbursement, I needed to go to the job fair for a couple of days. So I went, and it just so happened that there were lots of companies there. And I interviewed with a few of those companies right there on the spot at the job fair. So a few months passed. And I actually didn't get into any business school at all. And I was really bummed. But what came out of the job fair actually was that I got a job in Japan from this job fair. And so I was like, huh, well, I hadn't really thought about working in Japan before. But you know, this job sounds kind of cool. It's a marketing job in Tokyo with a US company. Why not? So I said, sign me up for that. So the next fall, after I'd graduated from college, October 2004, I packed my bags and moved to Japan. Uh, and I lived in Tokyo. And about one month into my job, my boss pulls me aside and says, Elizabeth, your Japanese is not quite as good as we had hoped. This isn't working out. I was like so devastated because I'm like, wow, this is you know, my first job out of college. And I'm already in the boot after just one month. Like, How many people does this happen to? Um, and I'd already moved everything over there. So I was really, really bummed. I couldn't actually talk about this for the longest time. But uh, when you have a failure, it actually opens up opportunities. Because what ended up happening was, because I no longer had to work at this job, I decided, well, what do I want to do? I, I really actually liked MIT a lot when I went to visit the year before. Why don't I try applying again? And this time I got in. So here we were. You know, it was great that I got in. But in order to get there, I had to get rejected. I had to get booted from my job before actually getting to where I wanted to go. And so the point is, in just that one year, I realized that actually, in order to hit success, you have to go through a whole bunch of failures. Like, that's just how it is. There's a very fine line between failure and success. You never know when success is just around the corner. And you know, failure can happen any time. And the more successful you want to be, the more failures you have to go through. So 
even though the story isn't about entrepreneurship, it, that, that year really carries with me even to this day because there are going to be lots of ups and downs in whatever it is you do, whether it's doing a startup or not, and perseverance is really key. So fast forward, some more time passes. Uh, I went through MIT, I graduated, and then I, I actually worked here at Google for a while. And in the fall of 2008, I decided to leave my full-time job here at Google, which also happened to be the worst financial crisis that this country has seen in a really long time. But I decided to do it anyway. Because I really wanted to start a company. This is something that had sort of been lingering in the back of my head for a really long time since high school. And said, you know what, I'm going to go and do it. And a friend and I decided to both jump ship. And we ended up starting this company called Parrot View. It was a social shopping web application. And it failed. And when I press this button, you're going to see why it failed. OK, so if you look at all the activities that we were doing with Parrot View, we actually started developing this product way before I even started working here at Google. And you can see that it lasted for quite some time, two years just about. And you can see that the points at which we talked with potential customers or users or, yeah, really, were only at the end. You can see that we did not get any feedback in the beginning or in the middle. It was only all at the end. And this is probably what you guys are going to learn this week. Well, it took me lots of years to figure this out. So this company failed. But right before it failed, because we built something that people didn't want, uh, we said, well, we have one last shot at this. You know, at the end, we started talking with users. And we said, we're running out of money. We're running out of time to do this. Let's, let's try one different angle. Instead of trying to build an application for consumers to use, why don't we see if we can sell this to online retail companies? Now, at this point, it would actually take quite a bit of work to do the transformation of the product itself to be sellable to companies. But it was, you know, within reach, maybe a couple months worth of work, but we needed sales today. Like, we had no money. Um, we needed sales today. So I didn't believe that this would work, but you know, out of desperation, I was like, OK, well, I'll just start cold emailing and cold calling all these online retailers. I don't have a background in online retail, so I didn't have a relationship with any of these people. Um, probably roughly around 100 online retailers said, no, not interested. I don't care. Leave me alone. They didn't answer, whatever. But what surprised me was that one company, which is actually quite a famous online retail company, got back to me. And I got on the phone with this guy. And he, I had a 15-minute phone conversation with him about what we could provide for them, not what we had, what we could provide for them. I showed him five PowerPoint slides, much like this deck, except this is longer. And so we had no product. He didn't know me. I didn't know him. I've never met him in, this person, in person, even to this day. And at the end of the call, he was like, I'm in. How much money do you need? And he was willing to put up tens of thousands of dollars just from this 15-minute phone conversation without even knowing me or our product. And so if you have somebody who is really excited about what you want to do, you'll learn that even if you don't have any technology. And that's what took me a really long time to figure out, that it's more important to figure out if you're building something that users want uh, before worrying about how you're actually going to build it. And so lesson number two here was really listen to your customers before you start building. And even as you start building, um, continue to get feedback to make sure that you're on the right track. So Parrot View ended up failing anyway. Like, we, it, it just didn't work out. And so I, you know, I still really wanted to, to pursue doing a startup. And I felt like I had gone about it all the wrong way. And so I teamed up with my best friend Jennifer, the very same person who introduced me to the startup business in the first place through her cousin. And I said, hey, you know, I really want to do the startup thing that we'd always talked about as kids. Um, why don't we do it? But this time, we're going to do things differently in two ways. The first was we were not going to get tied to an idea. Uh, you know, we, I realized from Parrot View that I was so convinced that Parrot View would work, didn't work in quite the same fashion. I decided I wouldn't get so personally attached to any idea. And the second thing that we said we would do differently is 
we would talk to users from the get-go before we even had anything to make sure that we were on the right track. And even as we started to build out our first prototypes, we would continue to make sure that we were on the right track. In essence, we were playing this much like an experiment or like poker, where it's like you, you bet a little bit of your time by talking with users. If you're not on the right track, you just fold. And you start again with something new, a different idea, a different angle, a different you know, whatever. And so that's how Jennifer and I decided to do this. And that's eventually actually how we got to launch Bit where we are today after going through several ideas that did not work at all. Now, this may all seem very obvious to you, that you should talk with your users. Um, but in reality, actually, it's very hard. And I'm sure you'll start to figure this out as you go through perhaps some of the assignments for, for this course. Because talking with people about your idea uh, isn't always a pleasant conversation. Especially in the beginning, you're probably not going to be on the right track most of the time. Like, you may get it wrong. And you'll have people saying, oh, I would never use this, or that sounds horrible, or ah, maybe it's not for me. Like, you're going to face people who have like, a lot of negative feedback. And it's very easy to take it kind of personally, because here you are. You know, you've worked so hard on this, and you're setting yourself up for rejection every single time you decide to talk with somebody, whether it's cold calling, cold emailing, cold Skyping, whatever. Um, you know, there, there are going to be a lot of people who have complaints and a lot of people who don't like what you're doing at all. But unfortunately, like I said in the beginning, you have to go through a lot of those mini failures, if you will, to really figure out, OK, this is something that people want. But it's not always easy to do that. And so it, it really actually took me a while, personally, um, to, to get kind of in a good zone. Like every time I would try to you know, pick up the phone, I'd have to be like, OK, I'm going to make this call you know, to this person I don't know at all, but who agreed to talk with me about my idea. And it would always just sort of be like, I have to work myself up to be able to do it. Um, and so when Jennifer and I talked about this, about how hard it is actually to talk with potential users, we said, all right, well, who's really good at this? Like, Who can we look to who's actually really good at this? And we realized that, at least stereotypically speaking, that uh, fat boys are really good at putting themselves out there. Like, they have no care about you know, saying whatever it is they want and whatever people's reactions are. They don't care. And that's actually really a great mindset to have in this particular case, because you are coming in as an underdog, and you need this feedback to improve. And the only way you're going to get it is to put yourself out there. And even though it's hard, you need to kind of be in the mindset of, like, I, I don't care what these people say. Like, I'm, I need this feedback. And so lesson number three, which I think was probably the hardest for me to learn, but the most, maybe even the most important to this day is uh, do what a frat boy would do. And in fact, we even had a sign in our office at one point that said, like, what would a frat boy do? Just to kind of reinforce this idea of, like, you know, you should not care what other people think. Like, you should take the feedback as objectively as you can. But you have to constantly put yourself out there, whether it's to get feedback, to get sales, to get you know, whatever, um, when, when working with your potential customers or current customers. So those are the three lessons that I learned over the last, I don't know how many years, <laughs> 15 years or so. And uh, hopefully, you guys will be able to learn these lessons in a much quicker way. And hopefully, you'll start some companies. Thank you. Building up your product, and you want to establish who your customers are going to be, and how you can talk to them about what you're building and whatnot. Where do you find these potential customers when you don't even know exactly what you're building? Yeah, that's a good question. So presumably, you have some sort of idea of what you're building, like in some field or for some. Do you, do you have some sort of direction, like at least initially? Um, so I, what I would probably do is, uh, it's usually really vague in the beginning, but talk with about one person of five different kinds of, I call them personas or types of people. So for example, if you have like um, uh, a food related idea and you don't know who your target demographic is, okay, is it like 
you know, is it the foodie mom or is it the, uh, you know, the whatever. Like, pick in your mind, like, can just imagine the kind of person who might represent each of these five different types and try to find one or two people from each of those types and just talk with them. And not even necessarily about your idea at first. Talk with them about the kinds of problems they're facing or the kinds of behavior that they're going through today. Like, you know, walk me through how you um, put food on the table or, you know, walk me through the kinds of restaurants you pick or whatnot. Um, just to try to learn about their behaviors and see if your idea will fit in. Once you think that your idea has a really good shot of fitting in, then ask more questions about like whether your product is something they would use. But in the beginning, like when things are all so vague, it's, it's a lot easier to learn about behaviors first and see where you can fit into their behaviors. It's hard to change people. Okay. So what, what is your background and were you an engineer or were you a business person? I studied electrical engineering in college um, and then I went to business school. But um, I do code, but all of that was learned sort of on the job through various internships that I had at web companies. Um, later, after college, I worked solely in marketing for technology companies. Um, but honestly, I think my biggest learnings have all come from just trying things on the fly. Like, I think I've learned way more from working on my own startup than from working you know, at all these other companies. What is so it's an ad network for email. So if you have a, like a high quality email newsletter, much like a blog, we can help you earn money on it by placing high quality ads in the email newsletter. So um, in terms of technically speaking, it's like how ads are on websites, but they look a lot better. <laughs> um, do you speak any Japanese before you went to Japan? I did. So I studied Japanese in school for about 10 years. But to give you a sense of how good or not so good my Japanese was, the very first day I opened my email and I was like, oh, I can't really read any of these. Maybe they're not for me. I'll just delete them all. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. You did yeah, that's a good question. So I think business school is a lot more helpful for working at a larger company, at least in the current form that business school education is. There's a lot more about strategy that they talk about rather than um, more of these kinds of entrepreneurship principles. And quite frankly, a lot of entrepreneurship is just doing. So I would say that to you know, for, for LaunchBit, it was mostly helpful in um, connecting me with potential customers or a network. But as far as the education went for, for LaunchBit, um, probably, I mean, you definitely don't need it at all. Yeah. Um, it's, it was much more helpful, actually, for me when I got my first job here at Google. Why did you go to business school? Why did you decide to form? Yeah, that's a good question. I, I honestly, you know, I, I don't really know. <laughs> I, I don't really know. Like, I actually thought that business school would help me for um, preparing for an entrepreneurship education. And I think, to be fair, like, I've gotten a lot of connections out of it, for sure, that have been super helpful. A lot of my classmates are now successful entrepreneurs. Many of our customers are also my classmates. So, but in terms of the actual learning, I, I, you know, I, I guess I can't really say that I knew what I was going into when I was the senior in college. Yeah. Um, could you, so you mentioned you got a lot of your connections from business school, right? If you want to avoid the business school route, can you recommend any other ways to get those connections and get more out of it in a shorter period of time? So the bulk of my connections actually have come just from you know going to various entrepreneurship meetups here in the Valley. It's actually fairly analogous to all of you coming together here. I mean, you'll all go through high school and then leave and maybe a bunch of you will become entrepreneurs at some point and you'll you know be friends with each other on Facebook or LinkedIn or whatnot and you know just having that sort of shared connection of you know an entrepreneurial interest is has been probably the number one source of folks um, a secondary source though has been from working here at Google many of my peers have left and started a company. In fact, I think the last speaker here, Samantha, was one of my colleagues at Google. Yeah? 
So you talked about you know using the chat the frat boy image to help you build up your courage for the calls, but how does being a woman help you in what you're doing? I'm I'm not I'm not sure being a certain gender is particularly helpful per se, but um, you know, like we, we all have different personalities, obviously. I think one thing in this sort of, which is both a double-edged sword, is there are very few women who are entrepreneurs right now, at least in the tech field. Certainly in brick and mortar, like starting a restaurant, like it's dominated by women. But in, in the tech industry, there are few women who are tech entrepreneurs. So that's both a, a blessing and a curse. Like um, I think that the Valley isn't quite used to, it hasn't become a norm where, where women are entrepreneurs here but the flip side is we all know each other and I think that um, that has been helpful but could be even more helpful actually if you know we were to all help each other a little bit more um, so that's both a blessing and a curse I think yeah in building your um, uh, company and whatnot did you feel like you got more out of the business school um, side where you know you learned all this stuff or did you feel that you got your so did you use more of your business school knowledge or the knowledge you actually learned on the fly? Oh, definitely on the fly. Yeah, definitely on the fly. <laughs> um, I mean, there are so many things that you learn just, by, just from doing that are so much more helpful than trying to apply strategies that very often work more at larger stage companies. I don't think business schools, for the most part, have, especially when I was going to business school, have caught up with um, you know, what entrepreneurial education should be like. Like, in business school, at least, you know, a few years ago, they would teach you you should write a business plan, and then you should project out your financials. I mean, quite frankly, like, nothing will go to your plan. Um, so it's more about, okay, how do you best think about doing something as quickly as possible? What's the right strategy for getting feedback as quickly as possible, changing directions as quickly as possible? Like, that's the kind of strat strategic thinking that you need, if any. And right now, I don't know of any business school that's really offering that in a great way. Some are starting to do it, but not in a great way, I would say. So like, what kind of skills or maybe personality traits do people value in the entrepreneurship and startup area? I think, uh, so I personally think entrepreneurs are made and not born. Um, maybe for some people, it's easier to get made into certain traits than others. but. I mean, being resilient um, to failure or setbacks, that's, that's a big one. Persistence in talking with people, your customers, either potential sales or in getting feedback or, or getting press, whatever. Persistence is another big one. I'd say those are probably the two biggest. Other than that, I see entrepreneurs who are both introverted and extroverted. I see entrepreneurs who are super well organized, others who are not. Like those things seem to not matter as much, but I think the two big things are persistence and uh, and and resilience. I had a good question. Um, so you seem to have a technical background, and then you went to business school. So what would you recommend for girls today? Like, should they go, or just people who want to be entrepreneurs in general? Like, should they go for the technical background and then go for something a bit more businessy, or what would you recommend? Yeah. So I. I am a big believer in a technical education, whether you use it or not, because I found that, you know, at least in going through my four years of electrical engineering, you start to think in a, in a, a sort of different way, like how you run into problems when you're building something, how you debug those problems or get to a solution is, I think, what I learned the most from going to college. And it's a lot easier to do that if you have a more formal engineering education. Obviously, you can learn many of these things on the fly as well. But if you have the opportunity, I would strongly recommend a technical education. As far as a business education, I, you know, I think there are a lot of people who have a very formal business education and, quite frankly, are not great business people. Um, and I think there are a lot of people who have never had a formal business education who are just really great at business. And I think it's actually largely due to those two things that I mentioned, persistence and resilience. I think that's especially important on the business side, it, you know, when you're pursuing sales or, you know, trying to get to customers and whatnot. Like, you need persistence. You have to be able to take rejection. And, and so I don't think that there's really a formal education you need there. Though there are probably, uh, well, I would recommend probably about five books or so that are, are excellent. That would probably get you to where you need to be.